But I do remember back in the, in the early days, it's funny that we did that because I was remembering back in preparation for this sermon about this school, and we've been here nearly 20 years now here in this school, not, not far off. And uh, I remember back in the early days, uh, this place had a big litter problem. And I don't know whether it was a lack of bins or the lack of discipline or the lack of regard that students had for the school that they were in, but it was a shocker. And uh, we would do Clean Up Australia Day here at Woodcrest College just to try and fix things up a little bit for at least a week. Uh, but each Sunday morning, um, I would often grab a wheelie bin and, and gloves in those days. You had to bend down and pick the stuff up. We hadn't discovered the little picker-upper things, which are awesome. And uh, I'd, I'd go around mumbling and grumbling. This place is a filthy mess. Don't the students have any regard for what they've got here? Don't the teachers have any discipline over their students? And around I'd go and moaning and groaning as the bin got heavier and heavier with all the stuff I had to pick up. And, you know, it took almost an hour just to clean the pathways that led to the auditorium. That was, there was that much mess back in those days. And, and uh, by the time church started, of course, I, was in, I just had an attitude which is, you know, not ready for church. <laughs> I might have looked like I was ready for church, but the attitude certainly was not. And then I, I did this for quite some time and then... One morning as I was doing it, going around mumbling and grumbling and moaning and carrying on, I just had this thought, Jesus is coming to church this morning. Would you do it for him? It was just a thought, a passing thought. See, I was doing it for the visitors. I was doing it to make the place look nice. I was doing it for our members, but none of that was enough to give me the right attitude. But when I thought, hang on a second... Jesus is coming to church. He said he would. Even if two or three came, he'd be there. What if I did it for him? It changed everything. It changed my attitude completely from that point until now. And thankfully, I don't have to do that little litter run too often anymore. We've got a great stewards team who look after that. But when I do it now, I'm praising, I'm praying, I'm thanking God that he's going to be here. It's a completely different attitude. You know, you know what the difference is? The difference is one word, vision. Suddenly I had, vi- for, for this menial task, suddenly I had vision. I'd been reminded of the purpose for what I was doing. See, vision gives meaning to otherwise meaningless little things that we do in our lives. Much of what doesn't appear to matter too much when it's evaluated apart from a a bigger context, it's boring. We complain about it. But when you put it in the context of vision, it takes on whole new meaning. Until I had a larger purpose of preparing a place for Jesus to come into, pulling a wheelie bin around and picking up litter meant very little to me. And many of you mums and dads in this past week have have gone through something similar. You've you've been getting your kids ready for school, you've been making their lunches, you've been ironing their clothes, you've made sure that they've got there. In some cases, perhaps you've even helped with homework already and you'll be doing it for the rest of this year and and maybe you'll be doing it for several years to come and, and really, in the end, it seems like just menial sort of tasks, just little things that don't matter too much, but when you think about them in a different context, when you think about them with vision, they become completely meaningful put in the context of a young person being prepared for life, put in the context of being equipped for for their grand purpose in God, being educated for changing their world, developing social skills that will help them impact other lives, learning disciplines that will give them structure going forward. When you think about those things and and you're putting the sandwich together or you're running the iron over that shirt, then you understand the power of vision. Vision. We're going there this year. And to kick it off this morning, I just want to read some verses with you from Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, the first 10 verses. I'm reading from the message version, and you'll see them on the screen. And uh, Paul, writing to the Ephesian church, says there from verse 1 in Ephesians chapter 2, it wasn't so long ago that you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. Very descriptive words in the message, isn't it? 
We all did it. All of us doing what we felt like doing when we felt like doing it. All of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. Instead, immense in mercy and with an incredible love, he embraced us. He took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did all this on his own with no help from us. Then he picked us up and set us down in highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Now God has us where he wants us, with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No. We neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. And now listen to this. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do work we had better be doing. You see, our th- we think our story began with Genesis chapter 1. We think our story began with that creation account, but that's not true. Our story, yours and mine, began before creation in the mind of God. God had a vision for humanity. He had a vision for this group of people gathered here. And he had a vision for you personally, and it all happened before he made one thing. Before light first penetrated the pre-creation expanse of darkness, God had you on his mind and what you would be doing. And these verses describe the working out of God's vision at that time. The working out of his vision through his son, Jesus Christ. The vision to restore us and and reconcile us to himself through saving us from our sins. The vision to send Jesus into our world to act as a sacrifice for our sins. The vision to see us forgiven and given new life as we put our trust in him. And the vision also that in this world we would be about his plan for our lives. Oh, it's an awesome plan. It's a fantastic plan. And he has a vision for our good. He just wants us doing it because he knows that's what's going to fulfill us. That's what's going to satisfy us. It's not burdensome. It's the things we're created for. So this year is the year of vision. I don't know how you feel about vision. I always found vision hard to get. Um, You know, and and as a pastor, they talk about vision all the time. I don't know whether you've noticed. (laughs) A friend of mine once said that, generally speaking, pastors are generally speaking, and they're, and they're generally speaking about vision for some reason. And as, he, as, as someone immature in pastoring, I just didn't get it. And God, what's vision? You know, I'm supposed to have it, and I don't have it. I don't know, maybe you're feeling a bit like that. Well, this year, it's going to unpack it all for you. We're just going to, if you don't have a vision, you're going to get one. If you don't know what vision is, you're going to know what it is. If you don't know how to get it, you're going to know how to get it. It's going to be a great year, a year of seeing clearly, a a year of hearing clearly, a year of moving and living clearly, and we will learn what vision is and how it's meant to fashion us personally, how it's meant to fashion us professionally in your workplace, domestically, in the home and in relationships with family, and spiritually, how vision is meant to fashion us that way. In each term, we'll look at a different aspect of God's vision. We'll look at God's plan. We'll look at prayer and fasting in the second term. We'll look at his spirit's gifts in the third term and his vision for us as a church together in the fourth term. It's going to be a great year. It sort of fits, doesn't it? 2020, 2020 vision. So in this first term, much of the basis for the preaching and discussion in life life groups is coming from uh, a book written by Andy Stanley called Visioneering. And we've got a a picture of it on screen. And uh, it's a guide to discovering and maintaining personal vision. And in it, Andy Stanley makes a statement and asks the question, everybody ends up somewhere in life. Wouldn't you like to end up somewhere on purpose? That's the question he asks, and it's the, the, the precedent for the book. And although it won't be necessary to, to read the book, 
um, to benefit from what we're doing together. The pastors are reading the book, and ordinarily we do this deal with Kurong, and uh, we'd allow we'd have books available for you to buy here. Well, we we bought all of Kurong's supply of this book, all ten of them, <laughs> in Australia. They came from everywhere, uh, so we could get a copy. So we've exhausted Australia's supply, but. If you want to read it, you certainly can. You don't have to, but if you'd like to, you can. And you can get it online through Amazon or Book Depository in print form. You can get it as an audio book. You can get it as an electronic book. Uh, just go to the website. If you need help with that, let us know, and we can help you with that. Um, so versions are available. But this term will be about 2020 vision, seeing clearly. We'll be unpacking vision, discovering our personal vision, and how to maintain that vision. We'll be learning of the 20 building blocks of vision, the things that are true about it and by which we can test whether this is vision or not. We need vision, not just to give meaning to what would otherwise be menial, boring and a source of complaint, but much more importantly, to achieve what we're designed for. We need it. What was firstly in the mind of God and then re-given to us through our redemption in Jesus Christ. You see, your salvation is so much more than just having your sins forgiven. It's so much more even than being adopted into the family of God and, and given a guarantee of eternity. Your salvation is so much more than that. Your salvation has also made it possible and given you the ability for you to live out what God has always meant for you. Gone are the days when we would say, how on earth did I end up here? We're not doing that anymore. We're going to have vision. We're not going to use guesswork to dis discover what choices we're going to make or what direction we're going. No, we're not doing those things anymore. We're going to seek God and we're going to discover his plan for our lives and we're going to go for it together as a church. Vision will give clarity to every area of your life, your relationships, your occupation, your finances, your service here in the church, and we're going to be covering all of those things. You see, there's nothing more fulfilling, there's nothing more satisfying, more difference-making than living the life and doing the things that God created you for. Are you ready for that? Oh, okay. <laughs> A few of you are. That's okay. Even if you aren't, it's going to be awesome. Well... In the remaining time we have this morning, I just wanted to drill down a little bit into the last verse of that scripture we just read from Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. And I just want to read it to you from a different version. For we are God's masterpiece. That's cool. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I am God's masterpiece. Can we say that together? Because I don't want to be saying it on my own up here. All right? I am God's masterpiece. Come on, say it like you believe it. I am God's masterpiece. Now, I understand that like a work of art, you might be hanging in a gallery that only a few people ever come to. Or you might be hanging in the Louvre where millions of people come. Or you could still be in the packing case. It doesn't change the fact that the Bible says that right now, right now, you are God's masterpiece. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been challenged in my devotional time to spend time just in Genesis 1. We were at a a pastor's retreat in Toowoomba, and just during the worship, I really felt I needed to spend time in Genesis 1 and unpack some of the statements that God makes about his creation because Genesis 1, I don't know whether you realize, it's really concise. Like only at each stage of creation, it's just a few words said about it. And I thought, God, I want to appreciate you more and what you've done in each stage, and I just want to spend more time here. And so, so that's what I did. I spent more time there. And I did find that in a short sentence, there is so much in there. If you just spend time unpacking it, take light, for instance. And God said, let there be light. Well, that's all we've got. 
That, that's all we've got in Genesis. But when you think about light for a minute, just think about it. What appears to be one colour, white, is actually a myriad of colours, and we know that because as it passes through a prism or water vapour, we get a, a rainbow in the sky as it passes through a diamond ring. We get that myriad of colours from red right through to blue and everything in between. This, this is Let There Be Light. It's full of amazing colour. Light gives energy. Without it, plants wouldn't grow. Light is the fastest thing we know of. We, we, we measure time sometimes in, in the time it takes light to travel or the distance it travels over a year. This is all in that let there be light. Light is so much more than just a word. It's how we appreciate everything else God created when you think about it. And in fact, without it, eventually everything else would cease to exist. Let there four, four words in Genesis 1. And we can unpack that. God, you're amazing. You say so little about it, and yet there's so much to it. All that and more is wrapped up in that sentence, let there be light. Anyway, as I was doing that, it became clear to me that God had the end in mind when he began creating. It's like he worked backwards from the pinnacle of, cre of his creation and worked out the steps required, one to six, to get to that high point. And, and creation's not a random series of actions and events. It's, it's an envisioned and planned process. God was thinking about it, obviously, and we, humanity, are his masterpiece, Ephesians 2 tells us. We're, 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 like, the, we're like the best we're actually not the end product of his creation. We're the beginning. We were on God's mind when he said, let there be light. We were what he was considering when he divided the water above from the water below, when, when the dry ground appeared and when he put lights in the sky. We were who he was thinking about when the vegetation began to grow and the fish filled the seas and the bird, birds the skies and the animals began to roam around on the land. Each day and each stage, unique and beautiful, and complex and important in its own right, for sure. But you and I are what God was aiming at. You and I are like the zenith of his creation, and not just who we would be, but what we would do. God had a vision for what each of us would accomplish. Vision is determined not just by what could be, by what, but by what should be. Because that's what God had in mind. We're going to discover what should be when we look at vision. What, was, what should I be doing? What, what was I created for? What, what did God have in mind for me? Because I can tell you what, it put a smile on his face when he thought about it. And I'm just talking about one thing. We're multifaceted beings. That means we can have multi-visions for the different arenas of our life. To have a mental picture of, of what you want in those various arenas and seasons and, and what they should look like down the road. That's vision. And all this is because God had a vision of you before time began. And when it looked like it would never happen on account of sin, he sent Jesus to ensure that vision had a chance. And at the cross we both gained something and we lost something. When we put our trust in Jesus Christ, when you said those words, Jesus, right now, I'm accepting you into my life. I accept your forgiveness for my sins. I accept the new life that you bring. Right then, when you said that, life anew began for you. You were born again, the Bible says. You gained a new life, but you also lost your right to live that life your way. The Bible says you were not your own. You were bought at a price. Andy Stanley writes, we do not have a right to take our talents and our abilities and our experiences, our opportunities and education and run off in any direction we please. We lost that right at Calvary. But then why would we dream of such a thing? God has a vision for your life. What could possibly be more, be more fulfilling than that? And beyond that, we have no right to live visionless lives either. Think about it. God has a vision for you, what you are to do with your allotment of years 
and you better get on with it. What a tragedy to miss it. Missing out on God's plan for our lives must be the greatest tragedy this side of eternity. And granted, this world offers a truckload of options when it comes to possible visions to pursue. But you were tailor-made. You were carefully crafted. You were minutely detailed for a selected divine agenda. It was what you were created and recreated for. God's vision for your life are the things that will give your life impact now and beyond this life. You know, we often talk about the things that are unique about us, our fingerprints, our iris, but you know something else that's unique for you? No other individual will be God's plan for you, God's vision for your life. You are God's masterpiece, our scripture told us. Not what you will be, but what you are right now. And only two things will ever stop the real work of art that is you being seen for who you are. There are only two things that will ever stop that. The first one is sin not being dealt with by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Sin will stop you being seen for who you really are. Jesus dealt with sin. If we put our trust in him, the masterpiece begins to be revealed. But the second thing that will stop that masterpiece ever being seen is never finding out what God's vision is for us, what we're meant to do. Without sin dealt with and without vision discovered, a masterpiece we may well be, but no one will ever know. On November 4th, 1966, the river Arno burst its banks and raced through the Italian city of Florence in the worst flood it had seen in centuries. Muddy waters rushed into the homes of thousands of Florentines. The flood came with little warning, claiming the lives of 34 people. Raging torrents entered streets, houses, shops, museums, churches and libraries. Thousands of frescoes, paintings, sculptures and rare books were destroyed or terribly damaged by the slime in one of the greatest cultural disasters of modern times. Such was the devastation that an army of young volunteers known as the Mud Angels came from all over Europe and America to rescue or help rescue Florence's treasures. The prompt intervention of the restorers and new methods of restoration in the following decades made it possible to salvage almost all of the damaged artworks. One masterpiece, however, was considered beyond saving. In 1546, artist, sculptor and architect Giorgio Vasari was was commissioned by the nuns of the Murate convent to paint the Last Supper. Painted on five poplar panels, the completed mural measured more than eight feet high and 21 feet across. When the river flooded, the mural remained submerged in filthy oily water for for 12 hours, damaging it beyond repair. When the waters receded to stop the paint flaking off, they glued a special paper on the surface of the painting and it remained in storage for more than four decades. In 2006, however, using new technologies and restoration methods, a team of art restorers were able to successfully remove the paper and clean the masterpiece without affecting the paint or its colour at all. What you can hardly see on the screen is the painting after it was retrieved from the flood and then covered with paper to preserve what was underneath. This next slide shows you the painting as it looks today. It was taken from the place of restoration and put in the, excuse the pronunciation, Opera de Sante Croce in Florence. And the president of Santa Croce commented on its return, what appeared to be dead has come back to light and colour. This story is a powerful analogy of our lives. A flood of sin swept over us. 
we appear to be beyond redemption, beyond restoration. But God had a vision. It was a vision he had since before the creation of the world. He knew what was coming. And he knew how to fix it. He sent Jesus Christ, his one and only son, into our world. So that we could be restored. So that we could be redeemed from that flood of sin. So that we could be born again. Full of light. And full of color. And God's vision didn't end there. He had a vision of who we would become and what we would do after receiving the salvation that's in Jesus Christ. He called us to be people of light and people of color. See, that painting was taken from the place of restoration and put back on exhibition to anyone who would want to come and see. That was its purpose. And God sent Jesus Christ so that we also could fulfill the purpose that he had for us. This year will be about finding that purpose. Not just one vision. Many visions across your life. It's going to be an awesome year. And we'll do it together. Father, we want to thank you and praise you for your goodness and your grace toward us. Father, we just acknowledge right now that we were on your mind since before the creation of the world. You call us your masterpiece, and sometimes we look at ourselves, Lord God, and we find it hard to say words like that, but it doesn't change the fact that your word is truth, and that is what it calls us. And Father, right now, I pray that across this, across this auditorium, if there's anyone harboring thoughts in their hearts and thinking, well, I'm no masterpiece, bring the conviction of your Holy Spirit right now, Lord God, that what they can't see with their eyes, they'd see with faith in Jesus' name. Perhaps there are some people here this morning, Lord God, who, who haven't received the reality of the vision that you had in sending your son, Jesus Christ, into our world, who, who are still burdened with sin. They're a masterpiece for sure. But they're just, they're just covered, Lord God, by by the slime, by the filth, by the oiliness of sin. And Lord God, you've got a plan for them. You've got a plan to restore them and redeem them. Father, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for some. In Jesus' name. And I just feel while every eye is closed, while you're praying, I just feel to offer that to anyone here this morning. Obviously, I don't know everyone here, but I don't want to let this opportunity go by that if, if you're in a place where, you, where sin has not been dealt with yet, where that stuff needs to be lifted off you by the great restorer, Jesus Christ, I don't want to offer you an opportunity to do that. And I want to pray for you right now, but I need to know who I'm praying for. So if that's you this morning, and you want to receive the forgiveness that only Jesus Christ can bring, if you want to receive his restoration and begin that journey towards understanding the masterpiece that you really are, I just want you to slip up your hand for a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. You don't need to do anything more. Thank you. Are there any others this morning who need to receive Jesus Christ into their lives, who need to begin that journey with him to receive new life? Just slip up your hand quickly, and then you can put it down. Thank you. Any others this morning? Thank you. Any others this morning? Well, Father God, we just thank you and praise you. You're such a good God. You're such a good God that you had a plan for us before you created anything. You saw our sin. You saw what we struggled with. You saw the mistakes that we made and the failures we experienced. And you said, I've got a plan. I'm going to send my one and only son, Jesus Christ, into the world. And he will live the life that they should have lived. And he will die the death that they should have died. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. 
We thank you for the forgiveness of sins and the new life that you bring to us through your son, Jesus. And right now, church, for those few people that put up their hands and maybe there are others who want to make that decision right now in their hearts, we're all going to pray a prayer. We're going to pray with you. So no one feels like they're being left out on their own. We're going to pray a prayer together which will invite Jesus Christ into your heart. Receive his forgiveness of sins and set you on the journey that God envisioned for you before the world began. So let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the forgiveness offered in his name. We thank you for the cross and we thank you for salvation. Right now, Lord Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart. Change me. Cleanse me. Give me new life. And set me on the journey into God's vision for me. Thank you that I'm called a masterpiece. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've made that decision this morning, can I encourage you? If you came with a friend, tell your friend that decision. If you didn't, we'll have pastors here at the front. I'd like you to come down because it's imperative that we help you now on that journey and give you some things that are going to help you and assist you with that. God bless you, church.